Today, we're going to look at how to find the length of a curve. Could be a curve in parametric form, could be a curve in polar form. Now, a little bit of this you did back when you took Calc 1 and Calc 2. Calc 1, you found the length of a, actually Calc 2, I think you found the length of a curve in XY terms, and you looked at them in parametric terms. Maybe you looked at it in polar terms. We're going to look at that in here. How about length of a vector curve? Now, again, I'm going to assume that you're reading through the notes and reading through the PowerPoints that are up there, because in the PowerPoints, I explain a lot about how to actually find the length of a curve, how the formulas work out. So just as sort of a reminder as to how we find the length of a curve. In two dimensions, we took a Riemann sum of the hypotenuse of little right triangles. So we had a little segment of a curve here. We had how much the x's change, how much the y's change, and this was the length of the curve on the kth interval. And then we used a Riemann sum to take the sum of all those l sub k's, and we found the length of the whole curve. If the function was defined parametrically, we needed the derivative of x with respect to t and the derivative of y with respect to t. And again, it looks very much like a Pythagorean theorem. Find the length of one little piece. Use an integral to find the length of the entire curve. So what do we do when something is a vector valued function and we want the length of that curve? Well, here is the general formula for length of a curve. Assuming that you have something in the form of f of t, g of t, h of t, right? Those are the three components of my vector. Then the length of the curve on the interval from a to b is the derivative of the first piece squared, derivative of the second, derivative of the third squared. What is that really? That's the integral, integral of r prime of t. So here's my little example down the bottom. I've got this helix, cosine t, sine t, t, and I want to find the length of the curve, or length of the helix, on that interval. So let's take a look at that, and then we'll take a look at one other case too. So if I want the length of that curve, again, my r of t that I'm working with is cosine t, sine t, t. All right, so what I want is I want the integral of the magnitude of r prime of t. All right. Okay, so that's what my goal is. Well, the first thing is let's find r prime of t. r prime of t is simply the derivative of each component here. So r prime is the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of t with respect to t is just 1. All right, so now I need to find the magnitude of r prime of t. So the magnitude of r prime of t is the square root of the first term squared, so negative sine of t squared, plus cosine of t squared, plus, yeah, I'm going to write it, 1 squared. All right, you realize that if you take sine squared plus cosine squared, that gives you 1. Those Pythagorean identities are going to come in handy as we move through this. So that first piece is 1 plus 1 squared. I end up with the square root of 2. All right. So now I need to integrate that magnitude. So I need to integrate the square root of 2 with respect to t. And now I need to go back and find out what my formula is. Oh, right there. I'm doing it on the interval from 0 to 5. So I need to integrate from 0 to 5. So if you remember the, the Calc 1 rules, it's just going to be the square root of 2 times 5 minus 0. So my answer comes out to be 5 square root of 2. That's the length of that curve, which is actually a helix on that interval. Now, not all of them can be done by hand. Every once in a while, you'll run into one for which you don't know a trig identity that will help you to answer the question. And so you'll end up with something like the square root of 9 cosine squared plus 20 sine squared, and you can't do anything with that. So you need to use an integral calculator, throw it on your graphing calculator. Just make sure when you do that, that you're integrating in radian mode, and not degree mode. You'll get a very different answer if you integrate in radian mode. All right, how about length of a polar curve? Remember from the end of Calc 2 how to find lengths of polar curves, or how to find a polar curve, how to define a polar curve, the different types of polar curves, cardioids and lemnus gates and all that. Um, if you have questions about them, let me know. I can pop up a couple of videos that review how to do information on polar curves. So if you want to find the length of a polar curve, it derives from length of a parametric. I think there's formulas in the PowerPoint, but here is, in general, the length of a polar curve. Length of a polar curve is going to be f of theta squared plus f prime of theta squared. Add them together, take the square root, and integrate them. So again, what's under the radical and the radical itself 
is that hypotenuse of a right triangle. And now you're taking all those little hypotenuse pieces and you're adding them together. The funky thing about polar curves is sometimes those the work gets a little bit long, right? The setup is not terrible, but sometimes it takes us a while to get to the answer. So this is a cardioid, right? If you remember what a cardioid looks like, if it's two minus two sine theta, it's gonna be a cardioid because the two values are the same, right? The constant and the coefficient of the sine are the same. And it turns out that the cardioids are hearts and this heart happens to open this way and then the other half, it's symmetric across that y-axis, opens on that way. Remember that the top of it is pi over 2, the bottom of it is negative pi over 2. So what we can do is we can use symmetry. We can integrate, or you don't want to call this 3 pi over 2 because you want it to be a continuous interval. So if that's negative pi over 2 and that's positive pi over 2, we can find the integral between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, and then just double it, and we'll have the other half because it's symmetric. Always make sure that if you're going to use symmetry that you're actually using something that's symmetric. Um, doesn't always work out that way if it doesn't. All right, so let's try a couple of side pieces of information. If this thing here, 2 minus 2 sine theta, if that's f of theta, then what is f prime of theta? f prime of theta is the derivative of that. So the derivative of 2 is just 0. The derivative of sine is cosine, so I get negative 2 cosine of theta. And the setup is not terrible. I'm going to set it up here, and then I'm sure I'm going to have to move over to show you the rest of this. All right, so we're going to integrate, we said, from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, and then we're going to double the results so that we get the whole cardioid. The integral we're working on is the square root of f of theta squared, so 2 minus 2 sine theta squared, that's f of theta squared, plus f prime of theta squared, so negative 2 cosine theta squared. All right. So that's the integral of the square root of, now, don't forget when you expand this first guy over here, there's got to be three terms. So 2 squared is 4, double the product of the inside, so the product of the inside would give me a negative 4 sine theta, so really I got a negative 8 sine theta, and then plus 4 sine squared theta, that's what I get from there. And then from here, when I square that, I get a positive 4 cosine squared theta. Yeah. All right. So this 4 cosine squared and 4 sine squared add together to be 4, right? Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So 4 of them must be 4. Now take the 4 from here and the 4 from here, and that gives me an 8. So I get 8 minus 8 sine theta doubled integrated from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Fantastic. What am I going to do with that now? I could wimp out and throw it on a calculator of some sort to find an answer. But how about trying to work that out analytically? Let's pull out that square root of 8. So I got the square root of 8 times the square root of 1 minus sine theta. So I'm leaving out my radical, my integrals and everything. I want to do a little bit of work on the side here. All right. Right now, that's not in a form that I can integrate. But maybe... If I multiply top and bottom by the conjugate, that'll help me. So let's multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 1 plus sine theta. So 1 plus sine theta here, square root of 1 plus sine theta over there. What does that do for me? On the top, I get a square root of 8. And then if I pull both pieces under the radical and multiply them together, what do I get? I get a 1. The outsides and insides cancel out because this is a difference of squares pattern. And then the last term becomes a minus sine squared theta. 1 minus sine squared theta is cosine squared theta. So I get the square root of 8 times the square root of cosine squared theta. And the bottom remains the square root of 1 plus sine theta. Why is that helpful? Because on the top then, I get a square root of 8. That cosine squared comes out of the radical as just cosine theta. And the bottom remains a square root of 1 plus sine theta. And now it can be integrated with a u substitution. If I choose my u's carefully, right, I'll end up with something that works out nicely. So let's choose the u to be this entire piece inside here so that I don't end up with du's under a radical. So let's let u be 1 plus sine theta. Then du 
is going to be cosine theta d theta. And yes, there is a d theta that I left out of here somewhere. All right. The limits of integration then also need to be reevaluated. So we need to reevaluate the upper limit of integration and the lower limit. This way, when we set up our new integral, it's entirely in terms of u, and I'm not going back and forth. All right, so what is u evaluated at pi over 2? Well, u at pi over 2 is going to be 1 plus the sine of pi over 2. Pi over 2, top of the unit circle, so sine of pi over 2 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So my upper limit of integration is 2. The bottom one is going to be 1 plus the sine of negative pi over 2. Negative pi over 2 is the bottom of the unit circle, so I get 1 plus negative 1. That's zero. All right, so what do I do with all of this? That square root of h stays on the outside. My new limits of integration are zero and two. The cosine theta d theta that's over here becomes my du. And on the bottom, the one plus sine theta is my square root of u. So really, this is the square root of eight times the integral of u to the negative one half du. All right, remember the reverse power rule, add one, divide by the new power. So add one gives me u to the one half, divide by the new power, multiply by the square root of eight. Okay, let's clean that up a little bit. Rather than dividing by a half, why don't we multiply by two? So I end up with two square root of eight times the square root of u, evaluated at 2 and 0. So what does that give me? 2 square root of 8 square root of 2 minus 2 square root of 8 square root of 0. Ah, look how nice. Square root of 8 times square root of 2 is square root of 16, which is 4, and 2 times 4 is 8. Now, we're not quite done yet because there's one thing that we left out. If we go all the way back to the beginning, remember we had that 2 that was sitting here? And I didn't carry the 2 as I went all the way across. So now i got to re-enter re that 2. So let's do 2 times 8. It gives me 16. So that's the length of the cardioid all the way around. We went from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We got a value. And then we doubled it to find the length of the cardioid. All right, arc length parametrization. I'm going to sort of introduce that. And then I think I'm going to let you do some of the calculations for that. Arc length parametrization just means that we want to know if the arc length is a parameter. So if you think of the unit circle, if you go all the way around the unit circle, you'll have gone 2 pi units as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. But if you go around a unit circle defined this way as cosine 2t sine 2t, on the interval from 0 to pi, you'll have gone around the whole circle. But as the t's go from 0 to pi, the arc length will go from 0 to 2 pi. So in order to figure out whether arc length is a parameter, there is a process that you go through. And that is, you need to figure out the magnitude of v. If the magnitude of v is equal to 1, then that arc length is a parameter. If it's not equal to 1, then it's not a parameter. So like I said, I'm going to let you read through to see all the derivations and how we get there. Let's take a look at an example here. Is arc length a parameter? And then we'll look at one that's perhaps a little bit more involved. And really, that's kind of the end of this section. So how do I figure out if arc length is a parameter? Well, I want to find, first of all, v of t. So if that's r of t, the first thing I need to do is I need to remember to derive. So when I take the derivative of this, the derivative of this is actually going to be three identical values. It's going to be 1 over the square root of 3 for the first term. It's going to be 1 over the square root of 3 for the second term is going to be 1 over square root of 3 for the third term. So this thing now is v of t. So when I go to find the magnitude of v, then what am I going to get? I'm going to get the square root of the first term squared. So when I square 1 over radical 3, I get a third. Square the second term, I get a third. Square the third term, I get a third. If I add up a third plus a third plus a third, I get 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So is arc length a parameter? Yes because the magnitude of that velocity vector is 1, therefore arc length is a parameter. All right, let's look at a case that might be a little bit different. This one asks you on that interval, 
is arc length of parameter and write a description that uses arc length as a parameter. So let's try this. First of all, we need a derivative. So the magnitude, well, first of all, v of t is going to be what? The derivative of t plus 1 is 1. The derivative of 2t minus 3 is 2. The derivative of 6t is 6. So now when I take the magnitude of v, I get the square root of 1 plus 4 plus 36, which is the square root of 41. This is not 1. So no, arc length is a parameter. The question at the bottom says find a description that uses arc length as a parameter. So it says use the substitution t equals s over the magnitude. So in this case, s over the square root of 41. So now I'm going to take each of my values in r, and I'm going to replace them with that new t. Let's see if I can fit this all over here. So now I'm going to call this r of s because it's not a function of t anymore. The first one, I'm going to take that t plus 1, and I'm going to replace that t with an s over root 41. So s over root 41 plus 1. Right? The second one, I'm going to replace this t over here with, again, that s over root 41. So I'm going to get 2 s over root 41 a minus 3. And then the third piece will just be that t multiplied by 6. So I'm going to get 6s over the square root of 41. Right? And now this is defined on what values? Well, the old ones were defined on values between 0 and 10. This new one is going to be defined on a different set of values. So let's replace that t with a 10 to see what we get. And we just have to multiply both sides by the square root of 41. And we get 10 square root of 41 equals s. And you can see that if I put a 0 in for t, then s must also be 0. So this is true for values from 0 to 10 square root of 41. And I'm going to specify these are for s values. The original question asked for t values between 0 and 10. This is now looking for s values. So these s values will work on the interval from 0 to 10 square root of 41. All right, that's the end of arc length. We'll do another video for the curvature and the normal vectors.